Hello, good morning and welcome to Unit 4 of the series of lectures on Supply Chain Risk Management. As I have indicated in the previous lessons, this is risk management as applies to the supply chain. And a lot of what is discussed here is discussed in the context of the supply chain and therefore is limited to managing risk in the supply chain. As I have indicated, this is a little different from risk management in financial institutions and risk management in insurance, in the insurance industry. They may not be too radically different, but they are significantly different. In this unit, we are looking at supply chain risk identification. We look at risk in today's business environment. We look at the supply chain itself in lecture two. In lecture 3, we looked at understanding risk. In this lesson, we are going to identify the risks. So, we will be looking at the procedures, the description that can be given to the risk associated with the supply chain, and how each of these can be put in a perspective that makes it easy to manage. So let's begin with, with what constitutes internal risk. And risk in general can be grouped as internal or external. Internal risks arise from the operations within the organization. And they might come from risks that are inherent in the operations, the nature of their work. Think of a typical painting company. The company is in the business of painting homes or buildings. If you look at the nature of the operations of this company, it is risk inherent. People have to climb high to high levels using scaffolders, losing ladders, <clears throat> and they have to hang in a way that sometimes is very accident prone. And unfortunately, there is no other way of doing it. You find that for these people, even the people who arrange the scaffold are different from the ones who actually do the, the painting. If there is any mistake, or let me reframe it this way, it is common for those arranging the scaffold to be careless and not tighten a certain part. So when we talk of inherent risk, we are referring to risk that is associated with the nature of the work that is being done. This, this come in the form of accidents, equipment failing, the system, the technological system that is being operated on fields, human errors, quality issues, all this just associated with processes. So, Apart from these inherent risks, we also have risks that emanate from management decisions. 
the choices people make as managers. Normally, this kind of management errors come in the form of the batch sizes to either bring in or take out the inbound batch size and then the outbound batch size. Safety stock levels, how much stock should be kept. Financial issues, where money should be, should be used, where money should not be used. At what point should money, money be stored? At what point should money be, be let out? Even deliveries. How should deliveries be scheduled in such a way that they don't delay and they are not too ahead of time? So, as far as internal risks are concerned, we can think of two broad ones. So, for internal risks, we have inherent risk what you can also call operations risk and we all we have management risks otherwise called decision risks So, when we talk of internal risks, these are generally what we, and you can think of it as a risk that come as a result of the nature of our operations. When you look at management risk, you can look at it as a risk that come out of the everyday decisions we make. So, risks from suppliers occur with as a result of the interaction between members of the supply chain. You know that the supply chain, as I described earlier, has a range. So if you have the focal firm, we have supplies on this side. And we have uh, customers on this side. You know that here we have tier 1. We have tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3. And we have uh, distributors, wholesalers, and uh, consumers, the final consumers. Now, you see that this supply side brings us risk. And the risk takes the form of reliability. Are the people we are wanting to deal with reliable? Are the materials that we want available? What lead times can they provide us? Because it, it is one thing wanting a particular uh, lead time and another the, um, the, the organizations are now being able to provide it. What are the delivery problems that they face? Any industrial action with these suppliers affects us as well. So if you are looking for the risk that comes from your suppliers, then you are looking at their reliability, you are looking at how they are able to make your materials available, what lead times they can give you, the problems with deliveries, industrial action, and so on. But we also have risk from customers. One of the biggest risks is variation in demand. I can tell you, when you produce because you think people will buy it and they don't buy, you have the headache of having to store. You have to look for a warehouse. You have to have put in place an inventory management system. You have to employ people with security. All this brings you risk. Then payments. There are some people, that, 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 in fact, when they take your product, you think they are angels. When it comes to payment, you are dead. You will fight them, go to court, whatever. It brings you risk. Problems with order processing, customized requirement. Everybody wants something specific. Meanwhile, you too, you have a generic production system. How can you vary this to make sure that you are able? It is not cozy that you can just change the shape as you want. No. If you are in the business of producing bottled drink and people tell you, oh, we need paper drink. 
it is not an issue that oh tomorrow no you can just produce a vapor drink no it brings you risk so we say that the main causes of these risks are inadequate cooperation when members don't cooperate among themselves you have risk from supply because suppliers will not even open up and let the focal firms and the other members in the supply chain know exactly the kind of challenges they face then a lack of visibility transparency things are done in secrecy issues are not too clear not everybody in the supply chain even understands everything that is going on in the supply chain all that give birth to this supply chain risks now the next are external risks and you know external risk is external to the supply chain directly and we have extreme weather think about it when weather is very extreme strong winds rain who can supply in it planes cannot fly trucks cannot move they have to park so extreme weather is is an external risk but it is a serious risk legislation rules and regulation government laws you remember there was a time in Ghana when uh, there was a law that says trucks shouldn't move beyond 6 p.m. You can imagine what risk that will have created for the supply chain in terms of delays. The truck is moving and then bam, it has to stop because it's 6 p.m. In fact, even wear and tear, because big trucks will tell you that in the night when they move, their tires wear slowly because the, the road is not hot. But we all know traveling in the night too, they get fatigued, they sleep, and they cause a lot of accidents. Then pressure groups, we have those who are, say who say they are, they are environmentally friendly groups. We are those who fight for the right of workers. There are those who, who want to see that business uh, uh, environments have been created to make work comfortable. All these pressure groups, crime, crime is a big, big external risk. Can you imagine uh, uh, um, uh, trucks moving, buses moving, and then arm robbers stopping all of them and then taking all the money they have. Natural disasters, wars, political instability. You know that one of the biggest external risks in Ghana today is political instability. Because hmm, anytime there's a change in government, businesses suffer. And now, diseases, pandemics like the coronavirus they are all external risks and they have serious consequences for the supply chain unless organizations are able to plan ahead, build resilient supply chain, we will come to supply chain resilience and then you build agile supply chain, we have just talked about agility, flexibility powers that will help you deal with these things. Having talked about that, we have risks that are associated with flows. Remember that supply chain in itself is about three flows. Flows of information, flow of uh, goods or products, and flow of funds or money. So, three flows. Now, let's look at Fiscal risk. Fiscal. This one is the physical risk. Where does it come from? Remember that we move in the supply chain, we move store materials of all kinds. So in the movement, we have fiscal risk associated with transportation, the truck, the vehicle. And when we say vehicle, we are not just looking at those that fly on road. The ship can sink. The aircraft can crash. The truck on the road can also get involved in an accident, leading to serious damages that are physical. Storage. <laughs> you can store something into a spa. You can store and in the process of the storage, they crash and then destroy. Delivery. Delivery challenges. Material movement, inventory systems, all these create physical risks. 
And these risks typically appear in the form of late deliveries, interrupted transport, damaged goods, such as shortage of stocks. So you 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 keep you store goods and then you come and it has run short. Who do you ask? Missing products, accidents, and so on. So it, it, I, I normally say that it, when when you seek ye the knowledge and all else shall be added unto you. As you appreciate what these fiscal risks are, you relate them to your organization and see what kind of fiscal risk that you face. Then you also come and appreciate how they appear. Uh, is your company facing any late deliveries? What is the cause? Is transportation interrupted because of accidents? Are there goods that are damaged? When you appreciate it like this, when we come to start asking multiple choice questions, you see, you are going to be able to understand it fully enough to analyze the question. Because remember, uh, uh, questions are scenarios. And we want to know what you will do in those instances. So you must be able to pick through the alternative that is correct. So bear that in mind. So fiscal risk appear in the form of late deliveries, interrupted trans uh, transport, damage to goods, shortage of stocks, and a lot more. Then we come to financial risks. So financial risks are associated with the flow of money. And they include payments, cash flows, debt, investment that don't yield the appropriate returns, accounting systems that don't check leakages. And they appear in the form of ROI or return on. So financial risks will come in the form of um, your, a low return on investment, excessive costs, unpaid bills, shortage of cash, missing accounts, and so on. They are serious, I can assure you. They are really serious. Then we go to information risk. So we have information risk. So think about it. This information risk is associated with the flow of information. Financial risk is associated with the flow of money. And fiscal risk is associated with the flow of what? Goods. And normally, there are systems and flows of information, including data capture. The data can be captured wrongly. It can be transferred to the wrong place. Data integrity. <laughs> Sorry. Data integrity suffers. When we say that data integrity has suffered, it means that the data has either been processed to the wrong person or people who shouldn't know about it have what? Gotten to know about it. It is because of this integrity issue that people don't want to give out the information. You go to the, you go to the organization and they say, oh, no, 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 I have to talk to my boss. No, this information is too sensitive. It can't go out. They are wanting to protect the integrity of the information. Because don't forget, the more people get to know about it, that information loses its value. So information processing, market intelligence, system failure. And all these appear in the form of missing data, errors in information, breaches to data security. So think about it. When we want to ask a master's level multiple choice question, we are going to say, for example, data capture. Is a typical information risk. It manifests itself in which of the following forms. So you will see breaches to data. You can't breach data when you are capturing it. How can it be missing information? Missing data. Yes, that is the result of data capture. Breaches can come from transfer, integration, and information processing. System failure can come from data capture. It can come from the information processing. So you have to be able to match these things. So when I am experiencing integrity issues with the information in my organization, how will I know it if I don't know the form in which it will appear? So integrity of information is married to breaches of data. Data security, breaches of data security. So it is important that as you, as you learn these things, you match them so that 
after you have acquired the knowledge, you can also be able to what? address the demands of the multiple choice questions you are going to answer. So we go to procedure for identification of risk. And we say that in principle, there is a general procedure for identifying risk. And what you do is that you divide the whole supply chain process into a series of distinct operations. Then you study each one of them in detail and systematically assess the risk in each. We took procurement and we said it, is, it involves identifying the, the material needed and describing it clearly. So we have description. Then we have sourcing for the company that can supply this material. You can call that order processor. That's another unique and distinct operation. Then after we have been able to uh, identify, uh, make the purchase order and so on, we have to deliver. Then transportation comes in. When we deliver, we have to take over. So when the goods arrive at our premise, we have to take it over. So you see that there will be what? Uh, receiving, there will be storage where, or warehousing, there will be inventory management. Then we begin to assess each of these and find out what is the risk associated with it. We have been talking about a paint company. We are painters. The question is, what kind of fiscal risk do we face? Paint damaging. When there's an accident, some paints are there, the, the, the containers cut open, and we don't pick anything. We lose money because we are not able to deliver the painting service we said we would do. We have also lost the paint. And then the information risk is, is, is a little over there because in the painting business, there is not much information uh, activity. So how do we make sure we identify the risk? We have to separate it into ordering, the ordering process for the paints, the delivery of the paint, and in fact, the ordering process for the material, the paint, the brushes, the scaffold, and everything. Then the delivery process, and then storage. Then we begin to find out what are the risks associated with it? So the general procedure is what? Identify the, the process, divide it into series of what? Distinct activities. Systematically consider the details of each of them. What goes into ordering? What goes into delivery? What goes into storage? What is the risk associated with ordering? Wrong order. Wrong material. Uh, Wrong quantity. What are the problems associated with delivery? Accidents. Transportation issues. Bad weather can affect it. So we look at all that. What are the risks associated with storage? Thefts. Improper labeling. Improper storage. What? Poor condition of storage. Then, we are now going to um, describe the risk in terms of their significance. And then we put it in the risk register. We can describe them as high risk, medium risk, or what? Low risk. Highly significant. Less significant. Medium significance. We can say severe. Not too severe. Or we can start from very severe, severe, not severe. All that are uh, uh, descriptions we can give to the risk. And that should enable us to update our risk register and we have the risk that are likely to occur to us. So if you look at this diagram, we can just look at the entire supply chain broken down into supply risk, demand risk. And you see that if you look at the typical supply chain, you know that 
if we have the focal frame suppliers are on this side suppliers of all tiers then we have uh, customers of all tiers so we have distributor we have wholesaler we have retailer we have consumer so when you just oppose this diagram uh -huh. so process risk where does process take place in the organization the focal firm because they are the ones that are engaged in usually in transformation they take supplies in the form of materials transform them into a service or a product that will allow them to meet a certain demand so if you look at we painting we in the painting company we are the ones who will take raw paints tap and time brush or a roller and then a scaffold and we are able to process or transform these into an exercise that eventually spreads the paint on a house so that is process so you will find that process risk will normally be associated with the focal firm now on this side is supply supply risk so you will find that the supply risk is associated with the upstream so this is upstream this is downstream so in this our diagram supply risk matches suppliers and demand risk is associated with the downstream in the downstream are generally customers customers take the form of distributors wholesalers retailers and the actual consumers the final consumers but don't forget that for this to happen we have to be able to what network all of this this the processes here must be networked so we have network control risk the connection between the focal firm and suppliers must be controlled it can be controlled through information systems or physically bottom line this is a network and it has to be controlled the relationship between demand and the focal firm or customers and the focal firm must be also controlled in a way because in this case usually this company must try to meet these people if it cannot meet them there has to be a negotiation so but that control itself also brings risk customers want a particular product you don't have it you want to give them another it can create a lot of risk because you can even risk losing the customers altogether meanwhile you will find that outside all this is environmental risk that is risk to the environment that can take the form of anything anything that can damage or violate any of the environmental principles form part of so when you put this in a system then we have the entire supply chain risk system and so if you take your time and you look at all this you should clearly identify where the risk your organization faces comes from so i will entreat you to take your time let this thing sink in you just take your own organization locate where you are and try to find the kind of risks that you face look at the process risk first look at the demand related risk look at the supply related risk look at the the risk 
with controlling all these units. And then outside that, the kind of environmental risks you face. Anywhere there's a cement company, don't forget that one of the risks they face environmental is what? Pollution. Because of the dust in crashing the, the clinker and, and the rest. So environmental risk is ripe over there. As an organization, you must think of it and you must find a remedy. Now, what are the sources of supply chain and the supply risk? This one. And you see that the first of them is dependency on just key suppliers. So rather than have a lot of suppliers, when they say we should build relationships, so you selected a few and you are working closely with them. Over time, you have become very reliant on them. They can bring you supply risk. That can take the form of late delivery, damages, material inavailability, and so on. Consolidation of the supply markets. Oh, where... You, you, you try to um, consolidate the markets from which you receive your supplies in such a way that you have created more or less like a single source. When you do that, you, you are in trouble because should anything go wrong with this market, then you have, you are finished. Quality and management issues arising from offshore sources. When you, when you source offshore, we can say you are sourcing beyond the boundaries of the location where you find yourself, usually overseas. So when you do that and there is any problem with it, even returning it is also another problem because the lead time will be long. Then pot potential disruption of the second and third tier levels. Don't forget that in this in this we have the tier one. They have they deal directly with with the focal firm. Then we have tier two that deals with the first group. Then tier three. Most of the challenges that we have with supply comes from these two. Where you have a situation where it is the the, the focal person dealing directly with the focal firm, there's usually a small problem. Look at the cocoa industry. If farmers were selling directly to cocoa board, that would not have been the, the problems there will have eased. Now they are also, they are selling to LBCs, license buying companies. So some of the license buying companies kill the farmers. They chuck their scale up, and the scale is so tight. So a cocoa that should normally be 70 kilo will just be like 65. And the farmer loses five kilos. If it is cocoa board that does that, you sue them because they are a legal entity. Though you can still sue the LBC, proving it becomes an issue. So what cocoa board has done is to allow their quality division to go around from time to time to inspect their skills, and then they find the companies that whose skills are found to have been adjusted. Then length and viability of replenishment lead times you know the time it takes for you to replenish the length of it and how it varies sometimes you will replenish in a week another time two weeks sometimes three months this will create supply risk now supply capability constraints the supply especially the mining companies many mining companies don't deal with local supplies because they don't have the capacity the things needed by the mining companies are big demands. And the local people don't even have the capital to be able to meet it. So you will find in places where even the local people have the money, the, the companies in Ghana cannot meet the demand. So they are forced to source from outside or offshore. Then global sourcing uncertainty. You cannot source anything globally and be damn sure that everything will go right. Because you are dealing with somebody virtual. Virtual. So everybody is risking. If you are going to pay the person, you are afraid. If the person is supplying you, there is fear. What if you are not a good person? What if this company doesn't exist? All these are there. Then let's come to process risk. So the setup times. 
and the inflexibility in the processes creates risk. When it takes a long time to set up, equipment reliability is also an issue. You know machines are funny. You can put them off today. Tomorrow morning when you put them on, they refuse to start. I don't know how many of you have lost your, the battery to your car. Sometimes, when the battery is weak, you come home, you park the car and you put the car off. Everything is okay. Next morning, you come to start. Battery says, take me. Then we have limited capacity too, where capacity is an issue. The, company, the focal company cannot just meet the demand. Either as a result of bottlenecks in its production process or in its supply chain. Then outsourcing. When you outsource key business processes, you are also in trouble. Because whatever risk the third party company faces, you also face it indirectly. Then lack of coordination and among the internal supply chain players. You know, even the units within the organization. They are internal supply chain players. So when they themselves refuse to coordinate, let's say in this university, administrators refuse to coordinate with lecturers, lecturers refuse to work with senior staff, senior staff refuse to work with junior staff, and so on and so on. It creates a lot of process risk. So a student will write a deferment letter and it will take the whole semester and the next for that letter to move from where it arrived to the appropriate place where a decision will be taken. At the end of the day, the student suffers. So sometimes you will find that some students are withdrawn and brought back because they wrote the letter in good time, but the letter did not get to its destination where the decision will be taken until eventually it was time to take decisions on students. And then the decision of boards will normally be withdrawn. Once a student did not register, does not have results, the first option is to withdraw. It means the student has abandoned the program. But if you are not careful as an exam officer and you quickly run into doing this thing, before you realize you have withdrawn a student who is active. That is why sometimes you will find that we call the students to find out what is happening to them before you take this decision. That is a, a coordination problem. Then demand risk. Now for this, hey, this major accounts. It's like your big, big customers. You just lose a big customer. Bam, straight away you, you are going to struggle for some time. You're going to struggle. Let's say our painting company, Kwanza Limited, is our major uh, or bedrock company because they are into building, building construction. And we work with them. Any building they, they put up, we do the painting. And then they say, hey, henceforth, we don't have to have anything to do with you. We can survive, but trust me, it will really hit us hard. That's a demand risk. Then volatile demand, that is very uh, demand that is fluctuating very fast, rising or falling without any particular reason or pattern. It makes it very difficult to plan. Then concentration of customer base. All your customers come from a certain class of people. As soon as they get angry with you, you are dead. Product life cycles that are short. So you see that you introduce a product in no time, nobody wants it again. It is today that we have seen um, a reintroduction of beads. The beads that the women wear on their waist and on their arms. It died out when these tight, tight dressings came about. And that created a demand risk for the companies that were in the business of producing beads. And then we have innovative competitors. In fact, they are one of the biggest risks because after a competitor who can innovate, they look at what you have done, do it differently. So they don't do much, but they always look at what you have done and they do it differently and they give you a lot of headache. Their network and um, control risk, you know, asymmetric power relations, organizations that are about the same size, having power struggles, then a lack of ownership. For example, you know that this is a supply chain. Nobody takes ownership and controls it, especially where the focal firm doesn't care. So what you will find is that it is a work that, every, that everybody is supposed to do, and therefore nobody ends up doing it. So every now and then, 
when there's a lack of ownership, it means nobody takes, takes it upon themselves to control the entire process. So everybody does what they want. And that creates a, a lot of chaos. And then inertia suffers. Inertia describes that inertia desire to take their decision. People are usually very sluggish. They take time. Oh, should I do it? I shouldn't do it. The person is consulting. The person is doing this. That inertia is very, very difficult. And it creates a lot of network and control problem. Because everybody is doing something. It is the turn of somebody to do something. The person is not even sure. Do I want to do it? I don't want to do it. I need to talk to this person. I need to do That inertia is key. So when you find people in life who really, really succeed most of the time, they, their inertia is high. That desire to take the initial step to do what they want to do. I can tell you, many of you are in this program because the, the, your inertia is high. People will tell you, hey, can you do it? Hey, every weekend, hey, hey, hey. But you, you decided that, look, I want to do it. I want to get it out of the way. And then, bam, you took the decision to buy the form. You are here today. You have two months and you are done. Something that looked like impossible is possible now. Those your colleagues who, who decided not to take the decision, which now they did. Poor visibility along the, the pipeline, that's the supply chain. When transparency is, 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 is missing, there's problem. Inappropriate rules. Sometimes you, you create rules, unnecessary rules that distort demand. Then a lack of collaborative planning and forecasting. People don't look forward. If you don't look forward, you will never plan. If you have to plan, you have to collaborate. So if we are planning to, to increase our painting activity by contacting more companies, don't you think we should talk to the people who supply paint? It is just that we are lucky that in Ghana, you can go to the open market and get paint to buy. Otherwise, in, in other jurisdictions, if you want a certain quantity of paint and you didn't place the order, you will never get it. Then we have the bull, bullwhip effect due to multiple echelons. You know, echelons are uh, big, big, like the senior supervisors, senior officers of companies. And so when they pass down information and they don't pass it well. Now, you don't forget that the supply chain has multiple echelons because among distributors, there are echelons, the top people. At the focal firm, there are echelons. There's, among suppliers, too, there are echelons. In the supply companies, you can think of it as the supervisors. But in the supply side, you can also think about it as those big, big companies who have clouds. Now, when these people pass information wrongly, the information gathers because of the cloud they have and because of the, the, the stature. At the end of the day, the information moves, but it is distorted and the distortion becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So usually when that exists, you will find a lot of bullwhip effect in the network of the supply chain and disagreements over control. You see, that one is bold. Agreements. Anytime there are disagreements over contracts, hey, controlling the supply chain becomes very difficult and that creates a lot of risk. The legal disputes, litigation, court, 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 court. We court ourselves. We go to court. It really creates problems. And Environmental risks, we have talked about them already. They include natural disasters that bring the supply chain virtually to a halt. You know, terrorism and war, same thing. Regulatory changes may just slow down the supply chain. But as for the natural disasters and war and terrorism, they can bring the supply chain to a complete halt. Taxes, duties, quotas, they will all slow down the supply chain. So, you may be asked which of the following environmental risks has the potential of slowing down activities along the supply chain. Don't say natural disasters because after natural disasters, they may slow down, but they can also bring it to a complete halt. Regulatory changes, I find it they, they may not necessarily bring it to a halt. It's rare. Unless it is deliberate. 
like the way we do it in Africa, where a government deliberately targets a company and comes out with regulatory changes that will hurt it, the way the National Communication Authority is doing. Intentionally making sure that they come out with regulations that make it difficult for even businesses that were operating already to operate. I have always said, anybody giving a position of responsibility is like the person is holding an oath before God. Whatever you do to, en to intentionally bring down the very people that you, you, you are supposed to pretend over, you create a risk, but that risk is punishable by God. So those people in authority who think that because their party is in power, they can do whatever they want. They should know they are creating environmental risk for all of us. Because trust me, if I have trained a student and he was working with any of the uh, radio stations, Radio Gold or Radio XYZ or all the radio stations and networks that have been brought down, let's say the person is a procurement officer and then you have closed down the station. It has affected me. I don't want to train a student who will be out there without a job. I want, I want that when I meet my, my, my students, I should be happy for them. Oh, I, 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 I have even moved. Now I am the this. I, I was promoted after my course. These are the things that gives us the satisfaction for the job we do. So you see the people that you have had something to do with their training and you are happy. They, 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 they. Some of them, I can tell you, you even get to their offices and you have to obey them. We go to offices and we obey the rules of the office. Even though the person sitting there was in your class. So I don't like to hear any company being closed. I don't. Because that creates risk. Environmental risk for all of us to deal with. Some of the people will never be who they are again. Because some of them have taken to certain jobs that is not even legal. I don't want to mention them. Why will we do that to ourselves? We are a nation and we must be particular about ensuring that we reduce environmental risk to doing business as much as possible. And there is nobody who has the right to talk about this than me because I deal with supply chain risk. And remember, the supply chain is broad. And therefore, at any point in time, when there is a careless regulation, it affects the supply chain most, except that people don't see it. Think of all those stations that have been closed and find out those people who were supplying them things. Have those people too not gone out of business? Look at the banks that were closed. Those who were supplying them uh, uh, checkbooks and other print material, wouldn't those people too suffer? That is the challenge we have. Then we come to organizational risk. And you realize that after the organization, the risk it will face is general and broad. Some of it are internal, some of it are external. Labor issues such as strikes, production uncertainties, because you are not even sure whether your machine will fail or not. Will you produce a, a, a product that meets the quality requirement? What are the IT-based uncertainties? You come to work someday. I don't know how many of you have gone to banks and they tell you, oh, we can't serve you because our system is down. Changes in ownership and management. And then mergers. Tigo and Airtel have merged. And now it's Airtel Tigo. Now, definitely this kind of merger can bring the uh, uh, streamlining of certain activities. And eventually some people will lose their jobs. Some third party companies will also lose their contracts. That is how it is. Because those serving Tigo and those serving Airtel will not be allowed to continue to serve Airtel to go. They will, they will sit down, assess the two, choose one. One loses. Those are all um, risks. And then we look at personal knowledge as risk identification to you yourself. And we say that you might think that a responsible way of identifying risk is to ask people who are familiar with the operations of for their opinions. So, when you do this, you are acknowledging that people working on operations presumably have a detailed knowledge of how those operations work. So, when you come to the university, I'm a lecturer here, I have a fair understanding of how the systems work. 
I have been an exam officer and therefore I'm able to guide students who want to defer, who have problems with childbirth, who have a problem with sickness, who have a problem with job-related travels. I am able to guide all of them. Now, consultants and outside bodies can also give val valuable insights. But normally, it is better to talk to the internal people who are familiar with uh, because when you talk to a consultant, he will give you a generic issue. Unless you are able to re ready to open your doors for this consultant to really, really look at what you are doing and decide what it is that they, they, they want to do. But all the same, using con consultants is not bad. But if you are to develop in-house capacity where people are able to identify the problem with the things they work, the work they do, it is better. So Toyota has a suggestion box. And I understand that it is compulsory. At the main plant, everybody must give a suggestion every week. What it is about what you are doing that we can do better. Of course, the company can reach them and many of them cannot be done. Others are incorporated and then their processes become better and better. So if you are a general manager uh, for your company or head of a unit, just institute twice a year or once a quarter suggestion. Just a suggestion box, an, 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 an anonymity. Just, you can even type it so that your handwriting cannot be traced. Give us a suggestion. What do you think we can do better than we are doing? And see, if you are not a big-headed person who doesn't take advice, I can tell you so many of the suggestions will help you a lot. It should, it's just that you should remember that it does not necessarily mean that those consultants can identify all the risk. They can't. It also doesn't mean that the people who work can identify all the risk. Because identifying risk requires a different set of skills, completely different set. But I would rather you use internal people to identify your risks than to use a consultant. After the consultant, he will tell you generic things. And at the end of the day, take his money. But the issue is why? Why must we say that the, uh, the consultants and outside bodies can identify the risks or cannot identify the risks? In what breath can they identify and in what breath can they not identify the risks? Then the internal people. Under what circumstances do we think that the internal people cannot identify the risks? Think of the why and do a discussion of it. It is an undeniable, it first, when you are dealing with um, consultants and so on, it is unreliable because you are recognizing the most, they will recognize the most obvious risks rather than the most significant ones. Completely missing the important risks and least trivial ones because don't forget they are coming with external knowledge and they are going to look at generic things. Things that are generally risks associated with, say, transport. But in your case, the last time I was talking with uh, people who were in the transport, the bulk transport of oil, some of the things they tell you, you will never believe it. I don't know which books can capture them, except that we do a paper and publish. Some of the risks are so Ghanaian related. So Ghanaian related. Can you imagine uh, 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 somebody mixing, after, after siphoning the fuel, mixing kerosene into it? Can you imagine? Going to kill people. You put it in your car and then the, your, your engine damages in no time. So managers are reluctant to admit any risks as this suggests some kind of failure. So when a, a consultant comes and is even talking to the managers, they will present a very rosy picture as if everything is in order when everything is not. So, usually, there are a range of formal tools that will allow you to develop the actual identification of risk process. Some of these tools are general in that they can be used to identify any kind of risks, but some of them are specifically aimed at the supply chain. So, know that these tools are not silver proof. 
they can help you to an extent. You must use you must allow personal experiences and consultation to really really help you out. So you can analyze past events, you can collect opinions, and then you can directly analyze your operations. Just take the operations one by one. See how you designed it and how you are actually doing it. You may be able to find variations in the way they are planned and the way it is being done. And you can introduce corrective action. So you should know that or you should bear at the back of your mind that the choice of appropriate tools depends on circumstances and particularly, one, the size and complexity of your operations. Look at your university. Our size is big. We are 63,000. And the things we do here are amalgamated. The organizational risk uh, of experience with risk management. Look at the, the, when, when these students went on strike. Everybody went back to 1980 something when there was a first strike. What did we do there? Can we do that now? So then the type and availability of the information you need. Sometimes to be able to analyze risk, you need a certain information. If that information is missing, you cannot do it. Then the availability of resources, particularly people and time. And generally, the level of skills and knowledge of the people you are dealing with. Where people are highly skilled, their ability to identify risks is, is easier than when they are generally uh, low, low, when their skill is low. And then, so, one of the tools for analyzing past events is the five whys. It involves you asking yourself, why this, why that, why this, why this. So we say that when, uh, when some risky event has actually occurred, the easiest way to identify future risks is to repeatedly ask questions about the causes of the past events and find the likelihood that it will occur. So you must find what was the risk event. Why did it happen? Why did you get it? So, if you look at this small scenario, there is a risk event. What is the event? A customer complained because we couldn't serve her. The first question that will come to your mind is, why couldn't we serve her? Reason, we ran out of stock. Of course, you won't stop there. Why did you run out of stock? Because our suppliers were late in delivery. Ah, what happened? Why? Because our order was sent in late. Oh, okay. So, you now want to find out from the ordering company, the procurement office, why did they order late? Because the purchasing department got behind with all its orders. Why would that happen? Because it used new staff who were not properly trained. So, by the time you will have asked the five wives, you will have seen the source of the problem. So that next time, you don't employ people who are not trained. Or, as a remedy to avoid future, you quickly train them. Then we have the cause and effect diagrams, also known as the Ishikawa diagram. And normally they look at the relationship between risky events and their causes. So, a typical uh, cause and effect diagram, which is also... Um, which is also um, called the fishbone diagram. So we have the issue. So we can say that customer not served. That is the challenge. First, why? Why? Because there was a stock out. What was the cause of the stock out? Another reason is late delivery. Another reason, late order. Another reason, um, new staff. No, yeah, late orders. New staff. Another reason. Lack of training. 
Another reason. Backdoor employment. Now, when you go into each of these, even the stock out, what happened? Maybe warehouse staff, late, late notice, late notice from warehouse staff. Something. By the time you look at all this, you will find several other reasons. And so at the end of the day, you see that it looks like a fish. Like a skeleton of a fish. That is why it is also called the fishbone diagram. It was developed by Ishikawa. So it is also called the Ishikawa diagram. Then we have Pareto analysis. And the Pareto analysis is like um, a background. According to Wilfredo Pareto, 80% of the resources in Italy was co controlled by 20% of the population. Now, this is thinking was borrowed into various disciplines. And in supply chain, we say that 80% of the uh, of the problems in the supply chain is caused by 20% of the processes. So the idea is that identify all the challenges. And then rearrange them. So the Pareto analysis will rearrange this into the, the problems in the order of magnitude. And the idea is that by the time we deal with these two, we will have solved a very big part of our problems. Now, if you look at student unhappiness, it is generally coming from registration and exams. Exams, we may not be able to do, to do anything about it because students would like not to write exams. But as for registration, we can put in processes to make sure that registration is easier. We have started. That's why there's a key here. That is supposed to allow you to register at home. And when you register at home, it hits our system. But that's Pareto analysis. Then we have checklist. Checklist is when you get a list of the courses things that are causing the delays, and then you work on them. So, for example, I take customer not served. What were the reasons? What factors caused that? I make a checklist of them. It's like you list all of them, and you are checking. Or you go and get a list of all the possible causes, and then now you look at which ones applied in this case. So, somebody is poor. Okay, you now look for all the factors that can cause poverty, laziness, lack of training, no job, uh, too much expenditure, something. Then you now look at this person who is poor. Is he lazy or is she lazy? No. So you cross out laziness. Does the person have a job? No. So you take. It means one of the one of the possible causes of this person's poverty on your checklist is no job. No job premium is there. You take. The person has a job, but the person wants to live beyond their means. So by the time you take the person through a checklist of what can cause poverty, you will know exactly what is causing this person to be poor. And then if there's anything you can do, you do it. Now, if you have to be able to deal with this, then you have to collect opinions. And the tools for collecting opinions include interviews, where you interview people, or group meetings. You call a group of people, meet them, and have. Then we also have, after you have collected the data, you can use process charts and control. You know, we have some of the process charts that will give us upper limits, lower limits. So this is upper limits. This is lower limits. So when you have set your limits, you expect the everything to be here. Anybody who goes out like this is a problem. When somebody goes out like this, it's another problem. You have to check. Those are process control charts. The process must be within a certain acceptable limit. When it goes outside, 
you have to control you have to introduce corrective measures thank you very much as i said if you have any issue with this recording please feel free to contact e-learning at e-learning at kmsd.edu.gh or e-learningkmsd at gmail.com thank you Thank <music> you.